Our next presenter is Dr. Jay Joshi of National Pain Centers. Dr. Jay Joshi is a nationally recognized board certified anesthesiologist and fellowship trained interventional spine and pain management physician. He's considered a national key opinion leader in pain management, and he has presented to a variety of audiences, both large and small, over 600 times. Starbucks is a priority. He's the first interventional pain management physician in the world to work at the World Health Organization in Geneva, Switzerland, in the Department of Substance Abuse. One of the top top physician experts in pharmaceutical anti-counterfeiting, and he's a mentor at Matter in Chicago. Patients have come from throughout America and around the world to visit him. Dr. Joshi has actually spent the morning conducting our CME sessions for us today, the first platform in the state of Illinois and, uh, for, for teaching physicians on medical cannabis. I actually don't think he even had time to eat. So as soon as this is over, please eat. Please welcome Dr. Jay Joshi. I'm sorry you didn't get to eat. Please eat after this. So. Thank you. Thank you for that warm welcome, Gracie. That was really very sweet of you. Um, but I have lemonade, so I should not pass out here today. So that's good. Um, we actually had, I think, I think we had a great uh, CME forum next door. So CME is Certified Medical Education. So this was the first certified medical education program for healthcare providers, pharmacists, nurses um, in Illinois on medical cannabis. So I'm like totally happy to be a part of that. You know, that's just, it's, it's always fun when you're sort of trailblazing and um, hopefully making a, a difference in a positive direction. I think, I think we did, and I think we had a great audience. Everyone was already very knowledgeable uh, about cannabis and medical cannabis and some of the science behind it. And everyone was just very open to learning about you know, the good, the bad, the ugly, but really most of it was just science. So here, what we're gonna talk about here today, um, this, is, uh, this is really not talking as much about the science. We'll touch a little bit about the science. We'll sort of talk about the history of medical cannabis um, and talk about how it relates to, to the chronic pain world, um, some of the pros, some of the cons, and, and really give you, um, uh, again, a little science into the insight into why it can be beneficial as well as why it might not be beneficial in some patients. Um, so really trying to give you a fair and balanced overview, not trying to take one side or the other. Now just that being said, in our practice, obviously we've seen some patients have tremendous relief and, and a tremendous response with medical cannabis. I wouldn't be here otherwise. You know, to me it's all about the proof is that it has to be in the pudding. Uh, this is not about just an opinion. You have to have something backing it, both from a scientific and experiential standpoint. Um, and then afterwards, um, I think, uh, Gracie, are we doing questions right after or the question and answer panel at the end? At the end. Okay, perfect. So we'll do question and answers at the end, at the uh, uh, end of the, during the question and answer session. So the history of medical marijuana, and we call it medical marijuana in this purpose as opposed to medical cannabis, because to me, medical cannabis is the um, almost the pharmaceutical-like way of dispensing um, uh, certain products from from marijuana. Now, in the past, it was just marijuana because in the past, you know, five thousand years ago. You did not have the extraction technology and the cultivation technology that we do today. So medical marijuana has been around for many, many years, okay? So in, in some respects, over 5,000 years. So this is not something that was just invented a few years ago. This is not something that was just magically created so you know certain big businesses could make money. I know that's what I've heard from some people. They're like, oh, it's just... You know, it's just an industry full of uh, profiteers and people taking advantage of people's pain, and that's simply not true. We have a, a ridiculous amount of science that dates back uh, decades in the Western world and hundreds and hundreds, or if not thousands of years, in the Eastern world. So when we look at ancient China, we see that cannabis was used to make fibers 10,000 years ago. And it was used in, the, in a medicinal way about 4,000 years ago. It's, it was considered one of the 50 fundamental herbs in traditional Chinese medicine. And it's used as an anesthetic 
uh, in a powdered or a mixed form. Uh, when they mixed it with uh, various solvents, one of them including wine, uh, as an anti-emetic, as a treatment for infections and parasitic hemorrhaging. Now, what we had talked about on the other side with the, in the CME lectures, we had talked about the science behind the endocannabinoid system, a system that's in place throughout the body, a system that's been around since we've been around, a system that looks at both the central nervous system as well as the peripheral nervous system and how they relate to each other when they communicate with each other. Um, Everyone knows that, everyone knows there's a mind-body connection, but it goes way beyond that. There's science behind that, and when you have a disruption in the homeostasis, you have a disruption in the way that the body functions both on the peripheral aspect, but also on the central aspect. And the central nervous system changes, it's something called neuroplasticity. So it changes in response to that stimulation or that, that disease. And if that's not kept in check, that's when we start seeing chronic diseases, that's when we start seeing diseases worsen. And, and, and it's both because the peripheral side was not taken care of, but beyond that, the central side was not taken care of. So the brain hardwires that condition in, and that hardwiring involves multiple different receptors. One of them is called the NMDA receptor. Some of the other ones are involved in the endocannabinoid system. So important to know that because this is the stuff that these people thousands of years ago knew. They didn't actually know why, but they knew that it occurred. In ancient Egypt, we have evidence that as early as 1700 BC, Hemp was used for the relief of pain from hemorrhoids. In ancient India, it's been used for thousands of years um, for a variety of conditions, including things like headaches, insomnia, pain, childbirth, GI disorders. Um, I'm sure a lot of you know that the, currently medical cannabis is approved in Illinois for these same conditions. Um, you know, we have uh, patients who take medical cannabis for sleep disturbances. Uh, they take it for chronic uh, headaches. They take it for GI problems like Crohn's disease, chronic pain, and various chronic painful conditions. It's not approved for chronic pain specifically. It's approved for a variety of conditions that result in chronic pain. Um, they also recognize the psychoactive properties, you know, again, thousands of years ago. Ancient Greece has been used for human and medicinal purposes for, again, many, many years. It was used for wounds and sores um, in various animals. It's been used for inflammation. Uh, the seeds were also soaked in wine and water. Uh, the dried leaves were used to treat nosebleeds and expel tapeworms. Now, I had a question actually uh, across the hall earlier today. And they said, hey, you know, I've, I've heard that uh, people are recommending that, that we should take a lot of vitamin K for the synthetic cannabis that's out there. And <clears throat> it's not the synthetic cannabis that caused the bleeding, it was actually the counterfeit blood thinner that was in the synthetic cannabis. Uh, this, it was really synthetic CBD that was available over the counter that caused that. Um, so what we, what we found, and in the past at least, they had used these dried leaves to actually stop the bleeding, not to, not to start the bleeding. So in the 19th century, it was really still used worldwide for a variety of conditions um, until you know aspirin was invented, and then it sort of that sort of started the, the pharmaceutical um, industry and uh, creating multiple products to treat multiple different diseases. Um, there was a gentleman named uh, William Brooke O'Sonnesy uh, back in the 19, 1830s. Uh, he had used um, cannabis or marijuana. Uh, for medical purposes, for a variety of different conditions, including things like muscle spasms and painful conditions. He also was using it for something called melancholia, uh, which we now know as depression, migraines, anti-nausea, anti-convulsion reasons, and as a sleep aid. So you're probably wondering, okay, what happened? Where, where was the disconnect? Um, how did suddenly, you know, the whole world knew for thousands of years that this is a plant that's very useful uh, in our society? How did it all go away? Well, back in uh, 1939, marijuana as a whole was banned in the United States under a federal law. And uh, this was called the 1937 Marijuana Tax Act. <clears throat> now, do you all know how or why? It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty, uh, pretty nasty, actually. It, was, it had nothing to do with science, it had nothing to do with medicine. It was, it was per portrayed that marijuana was uh, something that people of color used, and uh, it was really associated with a lot of racist connotations, a lot of, they say it was kind of a low class thing to do. And, um, and then so obviously that got perpetuated, and they said, you know what, we should ban this because we don't want these, these, these you know, horrible people 
you know, using these horrible drugs. So it was kind of, it, it was really misrepresented as a, uh, a drug that people of color would use. And uh, so it was obviously then banned as a reason. So really it was not science, it was racism that caused uh, uh, medical cannabis to, or I'm sorry, marijuana uh, to be banned. Um, <clears throat> it wasn't deaths, it wasn't science, it was idiots <laughs> um, using uh, really uh, uh, some nasty thought. Now thank you for that applause. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, in 1972, uh, it was brought to light that, uh, again, you know, in the Western world, actually in the Western world, it was uh, really brought to light that, hey, uh, marijuana might have some benefits uh, in 1972 for glaucoma patients, but really it started to be known uh, even as far back as uh, the 60s and 70s when um, a, a PhD out of Israel started exploring marijuana uh, for its illicit purposes, really doing research and wondering why, you know, why are people, uh, well, you know, uh, why do they get high, you know, what's going on? And he was actually the one who started discovering THC, started discovering that there were actually compounds, CBD compounds and derivatives of CBD that started helping with pain and started helping with, you know, seizures and starting helping with a lot of these conditions that they've already known about, but now there was actually science they could extrapolate these compounds, they could extract these compounds, and there was science behind why this helped. And that's what we need, right? And even now, that's what we need. We, don't, we need science to overturn a lot of the, you know, the, really what's gone on for almost 100 years, this perception that, that uh, it's such an evil drug that, that kills millions and millions of people. Um, back in the 1990s, um, a drug became relatively popular um, called Marinol. It really was uh, started in the 1970s, started becoming, you know, gaining traction in the 90s and even the 2000s um, as a synthetic THC that could help with pain. Uh, I, we prescribed it a few times when we really ran out of options, but um, never really found that it helped much. Uh, definitely didn't help as much as, uh, you know, patients who would come to our office and they would say, really privately, obviously, and, and just really until just a couple of years ago, I, it was really undercovers that they would say, you know what, I have to admit something. I, I smoked marijuana because I didn't know what else to do. And then so, you know, you sort of ask them, okay, what happened when you smoked that? Like, what, how'd you feel? You know, they're like, it took away my pain. Um, so then we'd say, well, you know, I can't advocate that you do this. And, and quite frankly, until even just a couple of years ago, we would have to be compelled to be forced to kick them out of our practice because that's what the laws stated. We could not, um, well, that's if we prescribed something, we prescribed any type of medication to them and they had marijuana in their system, we had to act on that. Either we had to cut them off of all their medications or, or kick them out of the practice. Um, so, so in some of those cases, we said, okay, if you stop using marijuana and I prescribe this Marinol, you know, maybe that would be okay. Um, so we tried that and it just, it failed in many situations. And the reason it failed is because medical cannabis is incredibly complicated. It's not just THC, it's not just CBD, it's not just, you know, a plant, it's, it's, it's so much more. You have to have the right combination of a lot of different compounds to actually have an effect and every single person is different. And that's why the synthetic cannabis really, uh, the synthetic THC really didn't and hasn't done the same things that, the, that medical cannabis has. So um, now circling back, back into the 1970s and 80s, uh, you had health departments in six states that were, started studying uh, medical cannabis um, usage. And then back in, from 1996 to 2013, we've seen multiple states adopt medical cannabis programs. Uh, 96 was really the first, you know, you saw that uh, occurring initially in, in California. And then the National Institute of Mental Health and the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Strokes uh, completed research on several medical uses of cannabis in the early 2000s. In 2003, the United States Department of Health and Human Services was awarded a patent entitled Cannabinoids as Antioxidants and Neuroprotectants. So we've seen in the endocannabinoid system, uh, it actually it can act as a neuroprotective system. So when we see a, a, an imbalance in the endocannabinoid system, we see an imbalance in neuroprotective mechanisms. In some cases, um, we actually see an overstimulation of the endocannabinoid system, potentially causing neurodegenerative changes. An underdeveloped uh, or underactive neurocannabinoid system, again, may see neural degradation and lack of maintenance. So it has to be just right. 
Um, they made a claim that's useful in the treatment and the prophylaxis of oxidation-associated diseases such as ischemic, age-related inflammatory diseases and autoimmune diseases. The cannabinoids that they, they were looking at um, were neuroprotective and limiting certain diseases uh, that really uh, we don't have any great answers for, such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and HIV dementia. So let's look at marijuana pharmacology. Uh, and actually, believe it or not, even from this slide, which is not old, we actually, um, we actually see some changes here. We know that 400 compounds are, exist in marijuana, and then a lot of those compounds are not necessarily compounds that we, that, that we want or recommend in patients. We used to know about 60 different cannabinoids. Now we know that there are close to almost 100 different cannabinoids, and all of them have varying properties and slightly different chemical structures, slightly different chemical structures. And, and just a little hydroxylation um, can change the compound significantly. THC, probably the most well-known one of them all. Um, it's the potent psychoactive agent that uh, I think everyone knows about, and, and really the one that most people are concerned about, because they're concerned, hey, if, if uh, patients have a lot of THC, or just people, if they have a lot of THC in their product, um, it's psychoactive. Will they be able to think correctly? Will they be able to drive correctly? You know, will they be able to function, cognitively function correctly? Uh, and that's still a, a concern, uh, and it's going to be an ongoing concern because, because no matter what, this, th these compounds, uh, we're not evolving as human beings overnight. So these compounds are still going to have some type of psychoactive component um, when you're looking at marijuana as a whole. Medical CBD is a little bit of a different animal, which, uh, which, which we'll sort of dive into in a little bit as well. Cannabidiol, so CBD is a precursor of THC. It blocks some of the excitatory effects of THC. It also is one of the compounds that has pretty much been well known for, uh, for, the, for the pain relieving comp, uh, components. Um, and as you, as you probably know, there is over the counter CBD that's available which uh, we found in some cases helps patients with pain, but in other cases it doesn't actually work. And one of the reasons it doesn't work is because it doesn't have the right balance between CBD and THC, let's say, or it doesn't have the right terpenes, or the administration is not the exact one that we want. Um, so there are a variety of reasons. Uh, CBN, a degradation product, THC also, uh, can block some of the excitatory effects of THC. Uh, there are some non-cannabinoid uh, constituents that are in marijuana that are similar to those that are actually found in tobacco. So again, compounds that we, we don't necessarily think are really beneficial from a medical standpoint. And in some cases, you could argue maybe they're, they're more harmful than beneficial. Uh, all the more reason why at least the medical cannabis that we have in Illinois, um, we don't see those compounds in there. Those compounds are removed. How do you get medical cannabis in Illinois? You know, what are the different uh, routes of delivery? I think this has probably been covered before, and most of you already know this, but there are multiple routes of delivery. So there are oils, there are tinctures, there are topicals uh, that are available. There are pills or edibles that are available. There are suppositories uh, that, are, uh, that are available. Um, there are ointments and lotions that are available. All of them exert different properties, okay? Just like any other medication would. You know, you have medications that are available in different uh, routes of delivery. Those different routes of delivery offer different relief based on, on the route. Some are quicker, some are slower. Sometimes you want it to be slower, sometimes you want it to be quicker. Sometimes you want it to last longer, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you want it to be localized, sometimes you don't. So routes of administration uh, are really important. And, uh, you know, so if you have a patient that goes to uh, a dispensary, if you go to a dispensary and, and you try a certain product, again, it may have a variety of different um, percentages of different compounds in that product, but the route of administration may make a huge uh, uh, difference in terms of outcomes. So let's talk about safety of medical cannabis. We, we all know that uh, directly from medical cannabis, I mean, unless someone really wanted to kill themselves, like maybe they, they um, you know, uh, took uh, what, what we consider to be potentially a lethal dose of cannabis, uh, if they really wanted to, there have been no known deaths from cannabis uh, when, uh, when the intent was not death. Um, and that's important to, to, to recognize because we don't see that same safety record with a lot of legal, over-the-counter things that are out there. Um, so what we usually see is that patients will fall asleep before they can even get to that lethal dose. Uh, so, right? So unless someone literally wanted to kill themselves by, you know, taking 
um, an incredible large portion and, and, and doing something really, really not so smart with it, it is really pretty hard to, um, um, to kill yourself with, with medical cannabis. So contrast that with what we see in terms of our society right now in terms of deaths. Um, tobacco, alcohol being the biggest ones. When I worked at the World Health Organization uh, and the Department of Substance Abuse, our biggest um, initiative at the time, it, it wasn't even, it wasn't opioids, it wasn't, because that wasn't really a problem back in 99. It, it uh, became a problem. I recognized the problem in 99. What I recognized as the problem in 99 was this stupid drug called OxyContin um, and the way it was promoted where you know, major hospitals, even to this, to this day, a lot of those people still work there, and they said OxyContin's not addictive at all. But we all know better now, right? Um, what was interesting, uh, when I, what I learned at the World Health Organization is a lot of countries, a lot of sort of the third world countries truly thought and think that alcohol and tobacco are really not bad. They did not think that they were addictive. They did not think that they caused any problems. And part of that was because it was rooted in the culture of those societies even though a lot of people were dying from these products on a, on a daily, yearly basis. In America alone, we see about a half a million deaths per year due to tobacco. Alcohol is estimated at 125,000 deaths a year. Honestly, I think, I think alcohol is way underestimated. Uh, addiction rates, they say with tobacco, is about 33%, about a third of patients. Um, and, and actually, some of the medical literature would, would, would actually not support that. They would say that to nicotine is actually the most addictive compound, more addictive than any opioid that's out there. And then that's backed by science. So if you look at that, you could say arguably it has a, an addiction rate almost close to 100%. So these are some surprising statistics, yet this is completely legal and people do this all the time. And when you contrast that with marijuana, which, which isn't legal and uh, doesn't have this rate of death and doesn't have the, the same type of addiction, that alcohol and tobacco have, you start wondering where, where did we go, you know, how did, where did we go wrong here? How did this, this happen? You almost wonder what would have happened if we had a time machine and we would have made marijuana legal and would have controlled alcohol more? Would we have less DUIs? You know, would we have less bar fights? Probably, I mean, like everyone would fall asleep at the bar, right? They would, you know, that, that's what a bar would look like. It'd be a place where they would have cots and things because everyone would fall asleep as opposed to get angry and start bar fights. Um, so kind of interesting when we sort of, if we could see a parallel universe and see what would have happened if we would have done things more scientifically. Um, but yeah, so, so with, medic, with marijuana, we, we just don't see that same rate of addiction and death that we see with other products. Um, I will get to this. That doesn't mean that marijuana has no addictive properties. We'll talk about the psychological thing in just a few minutes. And this is something that we definitely need to talk about. Not, not, sometimes not the most popular thing because... Um, um, because you know you have two sides sometimes of the pendulum, which is all for and all against. But you know, let's take that scientific road right in the middle and talk about what the facts show. So marijuana pharmacology, uh, we discovered in uh, CBN uh, cannabinol. We discovered that in 1895. Cannabidiol, CBD, discovered in 1934, and THC discovered in uh, 1964. So some of the pharmacology that we see with uh, cannabinoids. Uh, we, we find that they're present in, throughout the plant, okay? They're in the stalk, the leaves, the flowers, the seeds, the hash or the resin, um, and it's secreted by the, the female plant. Uh, after oral intake, blood concentrations can uh, reach 25 to 30%, and of those ob uh, obtained from the smoking route, okay, the same dosage. The onset is delayed, uh, it could be anywhere from half an hour to two hours, uh, but the duration is prolonged. And once it's absorbed, THC and other cannabinoids are rapidly distributed, um, and accumulate in fatty tissue. Remember, these are all fatty um, products, okay? These are all fatty oil products. So it's very dependent on fatty tissue and fatty uh, reactions. Some of the enzymes that degrade these molecules are uh, enzymatic reactions to specifically in the fatty system. Elimination half-life is about seven days and completely eliminated about 30 days, which is why on urine drug screens, we'll still see things like THC for up to 30 days afterwards because it's stored in the fat. Metabolism is in the liver, and this is important. Um, cannabis, medical marijuana, let's just say, or cannabis of any kind, but marijuana, um, can cause your liver to um, become loaded. And we've actually seen this clinically. We've seen patients who are uh, fortunately off of all of their other medications because we've been able to help them through a variety of techniques, including medical cannabis. However, their, their liver enzymes have actually gone up. We had a patient like this literally last week. So it is something that 
physicians need to know about, your healthcare providers need to know about, they need to follow up, you know, as patients also, you need to follow up with, uh, if you're on medical cannabis, I would say at least, you know, every six months or so, get liver function tests. We have seen this, and I don't think it's talked about enough. Again, it's a chemical, it's a compound, right? Just like any other compound. If you have a compound that you're taking and it's metabolized by your liver, or let's say your kidneys, or it's loading your kidneys, you need to have that checked, right? Because these organs work hard to metabolize or to discrete these products. So liver, fun liver is it's metabolized in the liver and definitely liver function tests should be done, especially on patients who are consuming these products on a daily basis or, or often. So if you're only consuming edibles? It, it's, it's, marijuana period, like any cannabis product, right? It's metabolized by the liver. And if it's on a daily basis, you know, you really should make sure that the liver function is checked and monitored because most patients who are on medical cannabis typically are not just on that. They're on other things as well. And, um, and so that can load the liver. So the liver should definitely be uh, checked just to make sure that it's not overloading the liver. There are more than 20 metabolites that are known um, with, uh, with cannabis products. So again, the major, psycho, the major psychoactive component is THC. Uh, when people have, let's just say you're taking marijuana, for example, um, and patients or, or people have smoked marijuana or have ingested THC, we're finding that it usually starts um, magnifying their existing personality. Um, so if, um, if people are maybe not in the best of moods and um, have some thoughts that are maybe not so positive, it may magnify that. Not to the same extent as alcohol, but it may magnify that. On the flip side, this is where some of the CBD comes in, um, where it can actually start you know, calming the patient. So, so which one wins, that can be variable. And, and sometimes it's, it's so variable that you don't, you don't even know what strain they're getting, what product they're getting, and that's where the variability comes in. And so again, from a healthcare provider standpoint, um, when we're looking at not regulated products, so non-medical cannabis products, this is where we get concerned because we don't know exactly what the patient's getting and what's going to happen. Whereas with CBD, with medical uh, cannabis products, um, we at least have a breakdown and we know what product they're getting and we know how it was manufactured and we know that there's no illicits or counterfeits that are mixed into that. Uh, just, um, just in the last month, you guys have probably heard about uh, the, the over-the-counter CBD, synthetic CBD that killed a bunch of people, right? You heard about that? They bled to death, literally bled to death, uh, because it had a, a blood thinner in there. Um, you had over 100 people that were rushed to the hospital. You had at least three people who have died. Um, and, and this happens. This is where we get really concerned about some of these over-the-counter products uh, and stuff that's on the street. So the effects of the mindset of the user in the setting, you know, some of the psychological effects may include um, disruption in attention or disruption in memory, like short-term memory, for example. Um, sometimes it may alter the sensory information, which we all know, which could be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on what that information is that they're trying to interrupt. It can act as an analgesic. It can help with pain. It can decrease motor movement and, and, and immunosuppression. That can be advantageous in certain situations, especially in things like seizures, tremors, um, again, like, like uh, for diseases such as Parkinson's, you may want to actually decrease the motor uh, function, the motor input, because you have an excessive motor function. Uh, can call ptosis, so this is a little drooping of the eye, increased heart rate, sleepiness, uh, temperature may change, relaxation, obviously, uh, increased appetite, and then finally, paranoia. I'm sure you've, you've uh, heard of that or seen that in certain uh, people who have, say, smoked uh, marijuana and who have that TH, uh, high level of THC. Uh, what can it do from a medical standpoint? Obviously, again, pain relief, reduction of nausea and vomiting, that's been really huge, as especially from a, a medical CBD standpoint. A lot of patients who, um, for whatever reason with their disease, they have a lot of nausea, a lot of vomiting, and this has helped reduce that. Um, helped in chemotherapy tremendously, as well as aged patients. Uh, lowering of intraocular pressure, um, one, of, one a great option for patients who have uh, in, high intraocular pressure and glaucoma. Uh, analgesia, promotion of weight gain, obviously with the increased appetite. Uh, we talked about the sleep and we talked about, obviously from a pain relieving standpoint and muscle relaxation standpoint. Uh, it, there, you know, we've, we've heard uh, the argument, right, against medical cannabis is, oh, there's no science, there's no research out there. And the reality is, is there's a tremendous amount of science and a tremendous amount of research out there. A lot of it did not come from America. And the reason it didn't come from America, because it is a Schedule One controlled substance, which means it's recognized as something that has absolutely no benefit to mankind as a Schedule One substance. 
uh, that also prevents research. So a lot of the research that has been done has been done overseas, and there's a tremendous amount of research looking at medical cannabis as well as medical cannabis in chronic pain. Um, Webb noted in 2014 that a 64% average decrease in chronic pain after one year of medical cannabis, that was a survey of 100 patients. Um, we've, we have seen probably the best safety record, at least from a fatality standpoint, um, relative to other products that we have on the market. Uh, no deaths directly from, you know, legitimate usage of a legitimate product, you know, in a legitimate way. And, um, and really, uh, again, with that same legitimacy, mild adverse reactions. Uh, cannabis and neuropathic pain, so nerve pain, so this goes back to this whole endocannabinoid system, as well as a central nervous system. Neuropath there's four types of pain that are out there. There's neuropathic pain, nociceptive pain. Uh, inflammatory pain and central pain. Okay, those are the four types of uh, topic uh, categorizations we have. Neuropathic pain refers to nerve pain. So like diabetic peripheral neuropathy or shingles pain, uh, those are all nerve pain. But a lot of other diseases have nerve pain as well. And we have seen that cannabis has been helpful in reducing nerve pain. Actually a very effective option in reducing nerve pain. Um, we've seen that anecdotally and there are studies as well to um, uh, to, to help support that. And we saw, those, we saw those, those data show that with low dose and high dose cannabis, we still saw patients re getting relief. So it sort of bodes into that whole, if it's done properly with the right uh, products, you don't need to have a tremendously high dose to be able to still elicit a positive response in patients. Uh, cannabis and HIV neuropathic pain, again, uh, regardless of the reason for the neuropathic pain, whether it was diabetes or HIV or another type of disease, uh, patients are still getting the benefits and we have now, again, data to help support that in clinical studies. Um, cannabinoids and cancer, uh, obviously you all know that it's been used in cancer patients and it's been used successfully in cancer patients to help not only the nausea and vomiting that they see with chemotherapy, but also the pain and some of the suffering that they have with, um, with, uh, with the disease. Interestingly enough, uh, if you sort of look at it from a roundabout way, if you can help them eat better and you can help them take their medications better, you may actually see a reduction in cancer because they're more compliant with the therapy. Um, it's sort of the same uh, concept we had uh, about 10 years ago, we discovered the mechanism of hot flashes. Hot flashes are the number one reason why patients discontinue tamoxifen. Tamoxifen is one of the most popular drugs that's used for breast cancer. 50% of breast cancer patients get off of tamoxifen because they can't stand the hot flashes. Now imagine if we can keep those 50% on, you've reduced cancer by potentially 50%. And so we discovered the mechanism behind it and a way to immediately reduce those hot flashes um, because of a central effect through a procedure um, that we do. Same concept can be used with, uh, with medical cannabis. If you become more compliant with your regimen, uh, you could potentially reduce the disease burden even more. Medical cannabis and fibromyalgia, fibromyalgia, is a type of pain that some people think it's a neuropathic pain condition. It's actually considered a central pain condition. Fibromyalgia is a central pain disorder. It's when your, your brain literally starts misinterpreting signals and, and it causes a whole cascade of events that I won't get into here, but a whole cascade of events that uh, results in full wide, wide body, widespread pain. That then starts actually affecting even your immune system. As we all know, the endocannabinoid system works on the neurological system as well as the immune system. So some of these patients, we start saying, you start seeing they're more sick. They get more infections. Uh, they can't fight things as easily. And it all stems from certain changes that occur in the brain. Well, we've seen medical cannabis that's been helpful in patients with fibromyalgia. Medical cannabis has been helpful in patients who have had migraines as well. Uh, there's long established history uh, and data on this as we talked about in the very beginning. It's been used for thousands of years on headaches. Waxing and waning usage for the last 1200 years, obviously in the last 100 years in America, it's obviously waned. But it's on the way back up. You know, patients who have these severe migraine headaches, what are their options right now? There are a few options, but what do they do in that immediate setting? Uh, medical cannabis has been um, helpful in, in alleviating and being uh, abortive with some uh, migraines, uh, which has obviously been very helpful. Anyone who's had a migraine before knows how incredibly debilitating those can be. Uh, medical cannabis and the anti-medic effect. Again, uh, we, we all know this, but just uh, if anyone ever asked, there are actually studies, the randomized clinical trials that have shown that natural and synthetic THC has been superior to placebo. And um, in many situations, patients actually prefer 
uh, the cannabis products uh, to some of the other products that are out there. And obviously, definitely prefer it to just suffering and throwing up all day long, right? So cannabis independence. So we've talked about, obviously, I mean, there are a lot, there's a lot of science behind its usefulness, a lot of science behind how it can help. And one of the questions we always get is, okay, um, and this is, this is like probably the most controversial slide on the deck because everyone's going to be like, well, wait, wait a minute. Um, so we do see dependence, but it's a psychological dependence. So very different than like, you know, um, alcohol or nicotine or opioids where you have a chemical dependence because of receptor activation and receptor binding. We see more of a, of a uh, psychological dependence. Um, so we see two, three things. We see one, a, pre a preoccupation with the acquisition of the drug. So we see patients who, who, who just keep thinking about when is their next, you know, joint, when is their next hit, you know, when are they going to, and uh, they stop focusing on what's, what's really important in, in life. So that's, that's number one. Um, that sort of goes to that whole uh, old uh, adage of stoner, if you will. Um, and there were some movies about that. What was that? I think it was like Fast Times at Ridgemont High or something like that. Anyway, um, but pre-acquisition, pre preoccupation of just getting it without, without a real reason why. Um, compulsive use of the drug and then relapse to a recurrent use of the drug. Um, some patients, or some people, I won't call them patients, but some people have um, used it as, a, as, even though marijuana might not necessarily be a gateway, they've used it as a gateway um, to, because it's easier to acquire than some of the other medications. So those are the kind of things that we see. It's more of an emotional, um, psychological, you know, dependence for a variety of reason, uh, not necessarily a, a receptor um, uh, dependence that we see, say, with opioids or nicotine or with alcohol. Um, and, oh, and finally, you know, some patients, some people are simply genetically predispositioned to having an addictive profile or personality. So that can also be an issue. So early responsiveness uh, determines the, the dependence, okay? What, you know, how did they respond when they first had, can you close the door, please, if you don't mind? Um, some of the early uh, uh, responses that we see, you know, do they, when they first smoke or when they first use this uh, marijuana, okay, specifically, did, did they sort of report this euphoric effect, this high effect? Um, did they use it for purposes that were more reasonable or were they using it for purposes that were more psychological? Um, you know, obviously some people will say they felt happy, but you have to dive between, read between the lines there of what does that happy mean? Happy because their pain was better, their headache was better, this was better, or happy because they just wanted to get blitzed, you know, or something, you know, disconnect from society. Um, the, the when, as, a, as physicians, when we start seeing patients who want to disconnect from society, that tells us there's an incredible amount of psychological undertone there. And we have to be very careful about making sure we intervene quickly because we don't want them to fall into a, a deep, dark hole. Um, some of the negative responses that were um, uh, unrelated to later dependence, you know, maybe felt ill, dizzy, passed out, uh, felt frightened. Um, when we see those, typically we don't see them uh, getting, developing that psychological dependence. So cannabis and withdrawal, it's not the same type of withdrawal you'll see, say, with an opioid or with alcohol. Those are receptor-dependent withdrawals that can be quite uh, serious, especially alcohol. Alcohol withdrawal can be fatal. Um, this is not that same type of withdrawal. This type of withdrawal, again, uh, there, there, there is some receptor involvement, but really it's more of, again, that psychological withdrawal. If, pe if people are, are um, uh, uh, dependent on cannabis and that's allowed them to eat, it's allowed them to be calm, it's allowed them to, to feel better, obviously taking that away, those symptoms are not only going to come back, but they're going to feel worse because of that, that, that sensitization that's occurred centrally. Um, if they're uh, taking it for other reasons and more psychological reasons, that's where that anxiety, that's where the agitation might come back in, even violent behavior, violent mood might come in because, because of those psychological issues that haven't been addressed correctly. Uh, cannabis in high-risk populations, uh, you know, here's an area where we don't have a lot of studies, a lot of data, because we can't study that here. So we can't study, uh, you know, we can't do randomized, well, we can't do trials really at all uh, with, with marijuana in America. Uh, uh, there are only a few places that can do that in government um, sanctioned places. But, you know, we can't just go out there and say, hey, let's take a bunch of elementary school people and, and have them smoke marijuana, right? Uh, so we're not going to see uh, as much data as we want, but we do have some preliminary data that I want to share with you. We're not going to be able to take patients who are pregnant and say, hey, let's smoke marijuana and see what happens, right? We can't do those kind of studies. 
Um, so we all consider all of these as high risk populations. Um, Pre-existing or latent psychiatric illnesses, you know, kind of just alluded to that. We're not going to be able to take those high-risk populations and say, hey, let's go smoke marijuana and see what happens. Um, so unfortunately, we, we just don't have that data, and so we have to use caution in those patient populations, again, from a safety standpoint, right? Because what comes first, do no harm. So we have to make sure that we don't do harm on anyone, uh, and that's the most important thing. That's paramount. So heavy use in adolescents, we have seen data that are, that are not trial related, but this data from observational data. And we've seen that um, heavy, consistent early use in young children, we've actually seen uh, rates of schizophrenia in that subpopulation go up. Uh, so the thought is that, uh, um, that the cannabis or marijuana played a role in that because there's no other, there was no other variable that could account for that increase in schizophrenia. We saw the same type of thing with bipolar disorder later in life. When adolescents used marijuana, at a, at a, at a, again, at a heavy use uh, at a young age, you saw a higher rate of, of bipolar disorder when they got older. It's all observational data. And um, when you do observational data, you try to weed out for other variables. And if you, if you weed it out for those other variables and you can't come to any other conclusion, you come to that particular conclusion. Uh, so that is something we've seen. And we think that the reason is because the homeostasis has been disrupted. The endocannabinoid homeostasis has been disrupted. And uh, that is the cause for this imbalance that develops at a young age and then becomes hardwired as you get older. So remember, homeostasis is important for all types of facets of life. And when you disrupt that, it, it's not a good thing. Okay? So in terms of physical harmfulness, marijuana is much less dangerous than opioids. You're not going to see um, you know, the respiratory depression and the, and the lack of breathing uh, with marijuana that you will see with an opioid. Uh, definitely amphetamines, barbiturates, those all fall in that same category. Uh, as I said before, much less harmful than cigarettes and um, uh, smoking cigarettes and alcohol. Um, we talked about the fatality and we haven't seen that. Now, if someone wants to take a lethal dose, which we consider to be somewhere between 50 to 70 grams at once uh, of, of marijuana, you know, it's like water. I mean, if you all sat here and took 10 gallons of water in the next 10 minutes, you're not going to be around. You're literally, your brain would explode because it would become swollen and, you know. So if someone really wanted to do harm to themselves, they can, and, and it's just unfortunate. Um, uh, but, you know, if things are taken as prescribed, if you take water as prescribed, you know, you're probably not going to die, right? Same thing with medical cannabis. If it's done as prescribed, we, ha we simply haven't seen the uh, deaths. Um, the dangers of marijuana smoke, okay? So why is smoking different than all the other forms of, of marijuana or even, you know, say medical cannabis even, right, or anything? Well, smoking inherently, you're burning something. Anytime you burn something, you get carcinogens. Any type of paper even, if you burn that, there are carcinogens that are produced. So, um, so you have twofold issues here. Anytime you burn something, carcinogens are produced. In addition to that, marijuana itself, remember we talked about it has about 400 or more different compounds, and a lot of those compounds are not necessarily you know, healthy compounds or good compounds, uh, just like you would find in, in, in tobacco, for example. Um, so, so we see the same thing. Smoking inherently hurts the lungs. Smoking inherently can cause pulmonary function decrease, COPD. Um, it can cause uh, potentially fibrotic changes in the lung, uh, reducing air exchange, reducing the amount of, of function that the alveoli, alveoli have. So we don't recommend smoking at all in, in really anybody. There's really nothing healthy about the, the, the process of smoking and burning anything and inhaling those contaminants. Um, in addition, just marijuana itself, remember we don't know when someone buys marijuana, we don't know where it came from. This is an ongoing issue. We see the same problem with generic medications, which uh, some of you uh, know I've talked about for years. Um, just a couple days ago, um, you know, the guy in Minneapolis, uh, the head attorney said, oh, it looks like after two years, after all our research, hey, I guess Prince did in fact die of a counterfeit medication that he had no clue about. Right? So he had a, a pill that said Watson 385, which is the exact pill that it should be for Norco. It contained absolutely no hydrocodone, no Tylenol. It contained lidocaine, U47700, and fentanyl. That's how he died. So he, he literally did not know. And this is where a lot of misinformation occurred for the last two years. They called him a drug addict and blah, 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 and all this crap. It was all untrue. He was taking Norco because he had, we, we all know he had degenerative hip problems because he was wearing high heels for 30 years when he performed. No, really, I mean, that's, that's you know. Um, so he had really bad hips. He was a Jehovah's Witness, so he didn't want blood transfusion, so they actually prevented surgery. So literally his only, you know, sort of solace and the only way he could perform is, you know, taking a Norco or whatever. 
uh, beforehand. So he had no idea that it wasn't Norco. And, and I had talked about this way back in 2016 when he died. And two years later, the authorities start talking about that. What does that tell us? It tells us the authorities have absolutely no clue about what the opioid epidemic really is. And they don't have any clue about counterfeit medications. We see counterfeit marijuana still to this day. Uh, we've had hundreds and hundreds of deaths in Chicago area because of tainted marijuana. It's been listed as opioid deaths, but in fact, those patients were taking marijuana. Uh, and so this is another reason why smoking, you don't know what you're getting, and so you'd be very careful, very different than medical cannabis. Uh, with that, I'm done. Um, and for no other reason, Gracie gave me a, the eye. <laughs> Thank you. Okay.